stand. Please stand. Good morning and welcome. Please do have a seat. Uh, if we've not met before, my name's Greg Bannister. I'm one of the ministers here. Uh, Pat will be leading the service. I'll be preaching a bit later. But for now, a few notices. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to everyone that made the summer fair, uh, the great event that it was. I think there was a lot of fun had. Um, we raised about 630 quid, which is great. Um, uh, and lots of people who wouldn't normally come here, I think, came and, 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 and met us, which was wonderful. A um, couple of things coming up. Uh, in the next few weeks and months. Uh, there's the all-age service next Sunday followed by a barbecue. If you want to find out more about that, there are flyers at the back. Uh, and also, um, because there isn't much happening for, for young kids and stuff in the summer holidays, we're having some sort of get-togethers uh, on the green space in the parkway. There are flyers for that at the back. If that might be of interest to you um, or children you know, um, then do take some and, and pass them out. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it's my pleasure to publish the Bands of Marriage uh, of uh, Benjamin Stewart, Gary Baker, and Christina Howells, both of this parish and getting married in this church, and it's great that you're here with us. I publish the Bands of Marriage of Benjamin Baker and Christina Howells. This is for the second time of asking. If any of you know of any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other now, you are to declare it now. Silence is good. We'd love to pray for you. Um, and we'll also pray for our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage and the gift of love. And we pray for Benjamin and Christina that their marriage be rooted in your love, the deepest and richest and most perfect of all loves. Uh, we pray that it would be a blessing to them and a blessing to all that they encounter. Uh, would you make it a rich, happy, growing thing? Uh, for your glory and for their benefit. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray for our time together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy of worship. We pray for the children when they go for their groups that you would meet with them, uh, encourage them, strengthen them in their faith. And we pray for us remaining here that you would do exactly the same. Thank you that you are a God for all ages and stages of life. So be with us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please stand. And I'll hand over to Pat for the rest of the service. So we greet each other. Let us worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. And a very nice one it is too. And we remain standing to sing our first hymn, Immortal Love Forever Fall.
Please be seated. And we pray together the colic for purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We come to that time again at the beginning of the service, early on, so that we can get ourselves right with God as we continue to praise and worship him and pray to him. So just take a moment to think of anything that you'd like to lift up to God this morning to, uh, to say sorry for. The scriptures say, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be. That we may love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive both your sins and my sins, and make us all holy to serve him in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we pray today's colic prayer together. Gracious Father, by the obedience of Jesus, you brought salvation to our wayward world. Draw us into harmony with your will, that we may find all things restored in him, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now our reading from Corinthians. Reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 to 17. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement, and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ, did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we stand again to sing our second hymn, Ye Holy Angels Bright.
remain standing for our gospel reading. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Remain standing and let us pray. Heavenly Father, please speak to us now through those Bible readings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I, I don't know if you noticed it, but there was a bit of a contrast between them. In the one that we've just had from the life of Christ, it's the night before he's going to get crucified, and he's there praying that his followers throughout time and space will be united, will be one. But then in the first reading that we had, uh, we had Paul writing about 20 years after Jesus prayed that prayer, and he's writing to this city, Corinth, and there's all sorts of divisions, and it's only about 20 years later. What's gone wrong? And also, what's this got to do with us? I mean, we are, after all, 2,000 years on, uh, and we're about 2,000 miles away, too. Well, Christ's prayer for unity, and don't we wish we lived in a world that wasn't riven with divisions, Christ's prayer for unity is a prayer for all of his followers throughout time and space, and so that must include us here at St. John's in Spalding. But what about Paul's letter to the Corinthians? I mean, it's weird enough reading someone else's post, which we're doing, let alone reading someone else's post out there. I mean, it's not as if there's anyone in this room saying, well, I'm a better Christian than you because uh, I like Apollos. He's my favorite preacher. There's a sense then when we read the Bible, we need to know we're reading a book from God. Yes. A book from God for us. Yes. But it's not always directly to us, as if you were to get a letter from your friends. I'm not an ancient Israelite, but I read the Old Testament. I'm not a first century Greco-Roman whatever, but I read the New Testament. What God is doing with the Bible is he is telling us what he wants us to know, but through what he said back then. In a sense, the principles are the same for then and for now, um, but it does mean that sometimes when we come to Bible passages, um, they won't always sort of fit immediately. There's a certain amount of if the shoe fits, wear it. Um, so. The, the passage in Corinthians is about unity. We're not going to face exactly the same challenges to unity that Paul did in dealing with Corinth. But the principles that he uses to tackle disunity are good principles for spiritual life now. Yep, the principles are the same. They just get applied in different settings. So um, here's how Paul opened the letter. To the church of God that's in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy people, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus. He says to the Christians in Corinth, you're part of a wider body of Christians who have been called to belong to God as his special treasured holy possession. You've been sanctified, but also you've been called along with every other Christian to be holy to reflect his own holy, good, pure, and perfect character. And then he said to the Corinthians, look, because you've got Christ, you've been spiritually enriched in every way. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that's been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way, you have been enriched in him. We are Christ's treasured possession in the church, and he is our treasured possession, our Lord. And what that means, though, is if, if there's all enrichment in Christ, the shortcomings of the church aren't due to his fault. <laughs> it is when we fall short and we do as a church, it's because we haven't made the most 
of what we've got in him in terms of spiritual resources for godliness, goodness, and love. But all of this language of possession, you know, we're gods, God's ours, um, is not about ownership so much as deep relationship. It's a bit like marriage vows, isn't it? You do say, all that I have, I share with you, um, but that's because it's ex- expressing a relationship. The relationship comes first. And Paul then ended his opening greeting by saying, look, God's faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So all Christians, we've been called into fellowship, a binding, loving relationship with Christ, and also a binding, loving relationship with one another. There should be fellowship, says Paul, but of course in Corinth there isn't. So he reminds them of every church's high calling, which is to unity. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement. There should be no divisions among you, but you should be united in the same mind and the same purpose. It's not like the church in Corinth had kind of splintered into factions that weren't talking to one another. There was still one church, but there wasn't agreement and unity in mind and purpose. But that's what God wants for them, wanted for them back then, and for us now. It's every church's high calling. It's not a calling to be uniform. We're not all meant to be clones of one another. It's great that we have the diversity that we have. But there's meant to be a unity, a deep unity of mind, heart, and purpose. How do we do that? Well, we could do consensus, couldn't we? We could all sit around in a big table, around in, uh, on a big table, on a big table, sit around a large table, and we could all talk about it and try and find some middle ground. Um, but that would shift and change as people came and whatever. Um, and then it would be a purely human thing, wouldn't it? No, it's not that. What Paul says is, I appeal to you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, go for the mind of Christ. When you all have the mind of Christ, you'll have the same mind. When you're all working at fulfilling the purpose of Christ, you'll have the same purpose. That's what the high calling is. Gather round Christ. Know him together. And then together you'll move forwards in growth and purpose and service for him will then be filled with his perfect love and be able to follow in his good, pleasing, and perfect way. That's the high calling. Sadly, in Corinth, that wasn't what was happening because there were divisions. It's been reported to me by Chloe's people, Paul wrote, that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. We don't know who Chloe was, but, you know, maybe she'd sent someone on a business trip from Ephesus where she was and where Paul was writing to Corinth, and then they'd come back with all of this news of this division. Um, And it all sounds a bit primary school playground, doesn't it, really? Cephas, another name for Peter. Cephas is a better leader. I'm following him. I was baptized by Paul. He's my man. Apollos is easily the best preacher out of all of them. Um, You know, it could be the school playground. But that's just some of the division. Actually, there's all kinds of fissures in the Corinthian church. There's divisions between rich and poor. There's divisions between people who have decided to become vegetarian for spiritual reasons and people that haven't. Um, There's division between some people who've been given a supernatural spiritual prayer language and some people that haven't. And there's more divisions besides. It's a long letter. There are 16 chapters in it, and disagreement amongst Christians is in most of them. What's Paul doing there? He's not against difference. He's against division. He doesn't want us all to be clones. He's not against... He's not after uniformity. He says... Be the body of Christ, the family of God, that can express unity across differences. See, one of the really good things we have at St. John's in our midst is on a typical Sunday, we have got um, Church of England folk, yes, um, but we've also got Roman Catholics. We've got people who've been brought up in the Methodist Church, Baptists, and Ethan Orthodox too. And that is most Sundays, most of the time. 
we also at St. John's have got very different worshipping styles. You know, the contemporary all-age service is very different to this. Later at four o'clock today, there'll be a Book of Common Prayer service, which will be very different to this again. You know, in many ways, we are united across our differences of age and race and gender. But before we get maybe a bit too smug, um, it's worth recognizing that in Corinth, there were divisions and fractions and fissures, but they were still all taking communion together. But Paul still had to write the letter to them. So we do need to ask ourselves, whatever it looks like on the surface, what's going on deep down? Are there divisions here that are unworthy of the fellowship of Christ? You know, in every group of people, there can be the danger that someone's rubbed someone else up the wrong way. And you know, so we need to ask ourselves, well, am I holding on to a grudge? Is there someone I need to say sorry to? You know, let's not just settle for British politeness. There's a deep unity of mind and purpose here. And of course, saying that forgiveness is not necessarily saying, and then we'll be best friends forevermore thereafter. But it is saying, do you know what? I'm going to let go of the hurt of the past and let go of the resentment and the desire for revenge and say, do you know what? Yes, something wrong happened, but there's still a true brother or sister in Christ. That's typical of every church. One area of potential division that I think is specific to us um, is that, thankfully, we've been growing. Thanks be to God, you know, over the last year and a half, St. John's has grown. And that then immediately opens up the possibility of division between those who've been long-standing members of St. John's and those who are newer. A lot of that growth has happened as a result of the relationship with St. George's Stamford um, in particular. And so then there's the possibility that there's division between those who think that relationship is a wonderful thing and those who fear that that relationship is a takeover um, from St. George's and we become some St. George's satellite congregational claim. Um, another source of division comes from the decisions that I have made since I've been here. You know, we've, I've introduced various new things St. John's has a history of traditional services, but we've created this all-age service. And then you've got people who like liturgical worship versus more spontaneous worship. You've got people for whom the Eucharist, the communion, is the most important part of the service. And you've got people for whom the sermon and maybe prayer afterwards, which I'll be offering after communion down there. Um, that's the most important part of the service. These are all things that are happening amongst us. They're differences that don't need to be divisions. They don't have to be divisions. But let's just be honest, we, we are all sinful, broken humans, and therefore they have the potential to become divisions. So let's pray that they don't. Let's pray that we enjoy the richness of diversity rather than worrying or being concerned that not everything is happening the way I always like it all the time. Um, I'm not saying that is going on now. I'm just saying that there's the danger, isn't there? Uh, God wants unity across difference. And I'm praying then, Lord, lead us this growing, gathering, diverse group of people so that together we can explore in a way that you want us to um, your love, your gospel, and then share it and reflect it to this parish where you've put us. If you think that divisions are there, um, then it's entirely possible I don't know, and I haven't spotted it, because one thing I have learned since becoming the vicar and the boss is the most exciting and honest conversations happen when I'm not in the room. <laughs> I don't want to know names, but I would love to know so that I can pray. Uh, you know, we want to be united. We do want to be united. Um, but I, know I may be completely wrong, but it does seem to me that actually we have differences, but we don't, I think, have lots and lots and lots of divisions here. Um, anyway, Paul's purpose is unity, and so that means he gives us principles that can help us grow in unity. Uh, there are three in the reading. We're going to look at two today and one next week. Okay? 
So the first thing he says is, look, look, Corinthians, you've got it wrong. Don't confuse Christian leaders with Christ. So he said, has, has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? Three rhetorical questions, all of which expect the answer, of course not. Is Christ divided or, or better apportioned so that there's one section of the church that has a complete monopoly on him to the exclusion of the other? You know, of course not. Did Paul die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and mine? Of course not. When you and I were baptized, were we spiritually united in a life-giving relationship with the Apostle Paul? Of course not. Don't be daft. Um, the great Christian news of salvation, the gospel, is all about what Jesus and Jesus alone has done for all those people who trust in him. Paul knows, as someone who trusts in Christ, he needs forgiveness as much as the next person. Only Christ can bear our sins and the judgment of God away. So don't confuse, says Paul, what Paul's done or Peter or Apollos. Don't confuse the messengers with the person they're telling you about, Christ himself. And I think the principle for us is when our focus shifts from Christ, when Jesus is no longer central, then we can start to make secondary things like the style of music, um, that way of robing or not robing for services, um, these preferences or those preferences, all of a sudden they become more important because when Christ is not central, I become more important. So remember the gospel, says Paul, of what Christ alone has done. Don't confuse Christian leaders or indeed any secondary thing with Christ. And second, um, don't confuse the gospel with our response to the gospel. So I've got a good friend, and he was baptized by someone who went on to become Archbishop of Canterbury. Really? Does Jesus love him any more than he loves you? Of course not. And yet, what must have been going on that Paul had to write this? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Daft, isn't it? Fighting about who got baptized by who, when the whole point is connection to Christ. Jesus is the hero, Paul is just the messenger, and so he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel. You know, baptism's a symbol of faith and a response to Jesus. So imagine this, imagine you needed some life-saving operation, and you went into hospital, and the doctors did it, and they did a fantastic job, and that's it, you're completely healed. How might you go around talking about it? Would you say, they operated on me, but you should have seen the way I said thank you. The way I shook the surgeon's hand afterward was magnificent. Yeah, but that's, the, you know, that's, the, that's all about, focusing all about your response versus, actually, do you know what? The surgeons were super. They did everything they could. I'm so grateful to them for what they've done. Again, when we take our eyes off Christ, we almost inevitably turn them on to ourselves, and then selfishness kicks in. When we keep our eyes on Christ, when we remember the gospel, when we remember who the real savior is, then we keep that perspective, and we keep our response to it in right perspective, and we keep each other as fellow brothers and sisters who need God's grace and love in perspective. We're called to be united. With the help of Christ, truly we can be. Truly that prayer of Jesus is, can be fulfilled in us. But what do we need to do? Well, in the words of the old chorus, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the divisive things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you, well, we thank you for the unity we do enjoy 
and we pray that you would grow us in it and you would teach us together more about your love and how we can share it. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's now stand again and uh, declare our faith. I just want to say, I, just, just, I read in a book once about um, a boy who went to a school and every morning they said the creed and he didn't say, I believe. And he felt he could say the rest of the words because he hadn't said, I believe. So let's make sure we all say, I believe. So, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen. So please be seated for our prayers. God, our Heavenly Father, you reveal yourself in Jesus, who gives us a glimpse of your glory and invites us to share in the unity of all that is holy. Meet us here today and teach us to be one. One in love for each other. One in understanding with all who find in Jesus the way to you. One in peace with all who find other paths to your truth. We bring our prayers and concerns to you now in the name of our Saviour Jesus Christ, whose prayer was ever, may they all be one. We pray for our country at this time of political upheaval and instability. Pray for a sense of calm consideration as those in government seek the way forward and elect a new leader. We pray that the accusations, hurts and mistrust of the past days and weeks may be put aside so that all may work for the best of the country. Give to all a sense of humility, decency and integrity as they make decisions that will affect us all. We continue to pray for and plead to you for the situation in Ukraine, for the refugees and agencies ministering to those fleeing the conflict, for the wounded and bereaved, the medics who give aid and support in harsh and often dangerous conditions. For political leaders and their advisers. For all who continue to work for a ceasefire and a peaceful, just outcome. We pray for our town of Spalding. Pray for all the churches and their leaders as together with their congregations they seek to bring the good news of God's kingdom of justice, love and peace to the people of the town. We pray
pray for a growing sense of fellowship and community. That together we can endeavour to proclaim the good news of the Kingdom of God, serve the people of our community and seek to bring help and comfort to those in need, both spiritually and physically. Give us all a clear vision of your purposes for us as a collective, holy, sanctified representation of your kingdom and your people. We remember before you those known to us who need our prayers and concern at this time. Those faced with mental, emotional and physical needs. Those who are unwell at home or in hospital or in care homes. Those awaiting tests, treatments or results. Be alongside them in their times of anxiety and reassure them of your unfailing peace. Remembering before you Robin, Mike Johnson, Evie Stanley, Reverend Hilary, Victoria Smith, Sally Sneath, Chris Paul, John and Derek Hammond. Pray for those who face dark times, dark days in times of bereavement, for those who have lost loved ones in recent days and weeks, and those whose memories are filled with the thoughts of loved ones who have died. Give to them and all who mourn a real sense of your calm assurance and peace. Uphold them in your everlasting arms and comfort them with your presence. We remember the families of Alan Macbeth and John Lane. And so we pray for ourselves. Help us to approach our decisions seeking your guidance through prayer. Help us to examine our own hearts for any unseemly motives. Help us to focus on the common good and not be driven by our own self-interests. Help us to seek consensus and never be satisfied with power plays and divisiveness. Help us all to share in our mutual ministry and witness. Lead us forward and help us to create a, a, a community where love, acceptance and support are expressed, where joy abounds and where results are achieved because we are all working hand in hand together. May it be said of us as it was said of old, see how those Christians love one another. Merciful Father, accept Seven these prayers, prayers for the sake of your Son, Son our Saviour Savior. Jesus Christ. Please stand again. As the risen Lord Jesus stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. So the peace of the Lord be always with you. And offering one another a greeting in the name of peace. We remain standing to sing our next hymn, Love Divine or Love's Excelling.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened the hearts of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice of sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. So please be seated as we pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are we who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. So we're still following our usual practice. If you would like to receive the wafer dipped in wine, please hold out both hands. If you would just like to receive the wafer on its own, clearly hold out just one hand. And if you would like a blessing, please keep your hands to your sides. And if you're not able to come up, don't worry, because we'll come to you. So draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which was given for you and his blood which was shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
So let us pray. Eternal God, comfort of the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and body to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Now we stand to sing our final hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself and the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service and the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts with hope and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and those you love forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.